when you meditate during a Dharma talk. Remember to keep the talk in the background and your meditation in the foreground. Because the meditation is the most important part right now. Bringing the mind to the present, focusing on the breath. Noticing what sensations in the body tell you now the breath is coming in, now the breath is going out. How to allow those sensations to be comfortable so there's a sense of ease and well-being. An affinity for the breath. And then allowing those sensations, once they arise and they're comfortable, to spread to different parts of the body. Because there is that danger. When things get comfortable with the breath, it's very easy to drift off. So you have to work with the pleasure. The word gamatan or gamatana, which is one of the names for meditation, actually means it's your occupation. It's the work you do. Work for the mind. And so even though we do want the mind to settle down, have a sense of ease and stillness, it does take work to get it there and to maintain it. Now the work is pleasurable, but it does require sensitivity, and that you think strategically. How are you going to keep the mind from wandering off? Or when the breath is still and comfortable, how are you going to keep it from falling asleep or drifting away into a state where you're not really sure where you are. It's comfortable, it's easeful, but you've lost your focus, which is not what you want. So once there's a sense of ease, think of it spreading through the different parts of the body, around the torso, down the back, out the legs. in the neck, down the shoulders, and out the arms, through the head, and allowing all the different breath sensations in the body to connect. So they're working together instead of at cross-purposes. So the process of breathing becomes even more easeful. And you can maintain a full body awareness all the way with the in-breath, all the way with the out. That's your main focus. That's your work. Now the talk here is, is here to keep you at work. Either point out things you might do or to remind you why you're here meditating. Think of it as a fence. The mind is trying to wander off. The talk is right here to direct you back in. So you can keep at your work. Because we are in training. This is an activity you're doing. There's a discourse where a group of monks are going to go into a foreign land. And so they go see Sariputta to pay their respects. And he asks them, suppose someone there asks you, what does your teacher teach? How are you going to answer him? So they ask his advice. What would be a good answer? If this were a normal modern classroom where you're being introduced to Buddhism, they'd start out, well, the Buddha taught the Four Noble Truths, or he taught the Three Characteristics, or the Eightfold Path. But Sir Buddha doesn't start out that way. He says, our teacher teaches the abandoning of passion and desire. Then he anticipates the follow-up question, passion and desire for what? 
of the five clinging aggregates, form, feeling, perceptions, fabrications, consciousness. And why does he teach that? Because if you cling to these things, if you have passion and desire for these things, then when they change, you're going to suffer. If you don't cling, there won't be any suffering. It's interesting that when Sariputta starts out, he doesn't talk about a, a theory. He, a theory. He talks about an activity. Our Buddha, our teacher, teaches an activity. We're trying to abandon passion and desire because we suffer from them. This is why we have those chants before the meditation, reflecting on aging, illness, death, separation. Looking inside at the things you tend to identify as yourself, or belonging to you. And then the chant on the world, the world is swept away, it does not endure. So you look inside and everything is changing. You look outside, everything is changing. And the mind is a slave to its craving, so it keeps going for these things. This is what we're, we've got to train. Now notice the Buddha doesn't say, just go along with the change and you'll be okay, because that leaves you adrift. I was reading the other day someone saying that that's the Buddha's teaching, don't resist change and everything is going to be all right. But change can take you in all sorts of directions, like a river. I take you to the sea, and then the river starts changing really fast. It goes over a waterfall. In fact, this is one of the image, images the Buddha uses. You can go over a waterfall, you can hit rapids and whirlpools, and all kinds of animals in the river. So that's, it's not just a matter of going with the flow. Or dancing with life, you know, dancing in a river, can really get you in trouble. Most people will say, well, you're looking at the world in a negative way. Why does the Buddha focus on the negative so much? Doesn't he see the beauty and pleasure in life? And the Buddha does. He admits very openly that there is pleasure in the five aggregates. If there weren't pleasure, we wouldn't be stuck on them. But they don't offer just pleasure. And the problem is not whether the world is a good place or a bad place. The problem is that we cling to it and we make ourselves suffer because of that. That's why we have to keep reflecting on the dangers inherent in these things, especially in the craving and the clinging. That's why we have to reflect on the dangers inherent in all this and keep that in mind. This is why we're meditating. It's not just that the world is a wonderful place and we meditate to appreciate its wonder or to accept the good with the bad so it can really have a lot of the good. We're here because the mind is making itself suffer over the world, over its sense of who it is, over the sense of the world in which it inhabits. And so we've got to train it in the same ways. An athlete in training has to avoid certain things and eat certain things he might otherwise not like and avoid things they might like. So he can strengthen himself and develop the skills he needs for his for whatever competition he's going to be engaged in. In the same way we we have to avoid things because they're bad for the mind. They may not be bad in and of themselves. But we start clinging to them, then it's bad for the mind to cling. And we have to devote ourselves to the path. Some aspects of the path are really nice. When the mind does settle down and attain concentration, it's extremely pleasurable. It's a sense of fullness, refreshment, rapture. They can be food for the mind. In fact, the Buddha actually compares the different states of concentration to different kinds of food. Good food, nourishing food. And 
but there are aspects of the path that are difficult. Renunciation is a big one. We're so used to going after sensual pleasures that it seems that that's what life is all about. If we didn't have sensual pleasures, life would be flat, tasteless, miserable. The Buddha himself said when he realized that he was going to have to give up those pleasures, his mind didn't leap at the prospect. But then he thought about the dangers inherent in holding on to these things. And so he was willing to let them go, and he found that in letting them go, or at least putting them aside, it opened up a whole new area for finding well-being inside. This is one of the things we have to keep remembering, that renunciation is not deprivation, it's a trade. We're trading a lesser happiness for a higher one, one that's more lasting, or in the Buddha's words, more abundant. But because we're so addicted to our old pleasures, we have to keep focusing on their drawbacks. This is why an important part of insight is not just seeing things arising and passing away, but it's also seeing where we're stuck on them. Where do we find our gratification? Why do we like to feed on these things? And then turning around and looking at their drawbacks. What happens if we feed on these things? So it's all part of the training. Again, sensual pleasures in and of themselves are not bad. What's problematic is the mind's feeding habits. Its willingness to enslave itself to its cravings. In the sutta from which that passage is drawn, Ratabala is talking to a, a king who doesn't understand why Ratabala would go off and ordain. He was wealthy, healthy, had a good family. Why on earth would he ordain? And Ratabala quoted those four summaries of the Dharma all about the world. And the last one, of course, world here means not just the outside world, but the world of the mind. And that last one, the world is a slave to craving. King doesn't understand. He's not a slave. And Ratabal asks, suppose someone were to come to you from the east and say, there's this kingdom to the east. It's wealthy, prosperous, everything you could want. And it doesn't have a strong army. You could conquer it. Would you go to conquer it? And the king says, of course. How about if someone were to come to you from the south and say the same thing? Would you leave it alone, or would you try to conquer it? You would conquer it. Same with the West and the North. He said, even if there, was some to, if there was someone to come from the other side of the ocean and say there was a kingdom over there, wealthy, prosperous, with a weak army, what would you do? And the king said, well, I'd go conquer that one, too. And Dr. Bell says, there you are, you're a slave to craving. No sense of enough. We go to all these difficulties for our pleasures. And what real gratification do they provide? This is another one of those summaries said, you know, you have to leave everything behind at some point. And then all you have is your karma. The karma of having killed, the karma of having conquered. And the rewards you got from those bad actions, they slip through your fingers and they're gone. That we may not be warlike, but we do have our ways of acting unskillfully for the pleasures that we, we see as attractive. And then when we get them, they're not all that satisfying. They do have their pleasures. The Buddha is not denying that, but they certainly do have their limitations. And what you're gathering up is you're not really gathering those things up, because again, they just slip through your fingers. What you're gathering up is the kind of karma that's involved. 
and planning, scheming, whatever is involved, whatever is required to get those things. You can't just back, sit back and say, well, I'm, just, I'm not going to try at all, because the mind will try that for a while and realize there's nothing there. And so it goes back to its old habits of scrambling to find things that are going to disappoint it. And this is what the Buddha offers, this training. This is something we can do to wean the mind away from its addictions, to free it from its slavery. So that's the issue. If you want freedom, you have to look at the negative side, that you have to look at the drawbacks of the things that have you enslaved. Look at the drawbacks of the food you've been feeding on, the food you've been feeding the mind. So it'll be willing to change its feeding habits, start feeding on the path instead. So it can gain the strength, ultimately, that it doesn't have to feed. So this is why it's so important in Sariputta's introduction to what the Buddha taught. He focused on actions, particularly the action of the mind, this passion and desire, this clinging, craving, this feeding. Now we can train the mind in new habits. So it can be freed from its slavery to these things. So for the purposes of the training, we do have to look at the drawbacks of our attachments. It's not because we're down on the world or bad-mouthing the world. It's because there's something better. A couple months back there was a woman who came here who was very upset. I was commenting on how we're not here for a sense of oneness. She said, I've had a wonderful sense of oneness in my practice. You can't take that away from me. And I said to her, it's not that I'm trying to take it away from you. It's something there's something better. As long as you hold on to that, you never figure out what's better. And she had a look on her face as if the idea had never occurred to her that there might be something better than that, but there is. So that's what the Buddha keeps telling us, okay, what you have does have its good side, but as long as you focus on its good side, you're going to be a slave. You'll never be free. You have to learn how to look at its drawbacks so you can find something better. So always keep the point in mind that you're in training. Because if you forget that you're in training and go back to your old ways, that's what you do. You just go back to your old ways, and you'll never get free. <laughs>